Today we're going to talk about pretty much what the human body class is going to be all about. Introduction to the human body. This class is pretty much just a very basic introductory course about anatomy and physiology. And so when we break down these two words, anatomy and physiology, if you look at the word anatomy, ana means up, tome or tomi means to cut. So the word literally means to cut up. And when you cut up the human body, you get the different parts that it's made out of and their relationship to one another. And so we're gonna be studying the different parts of the human body. The physiology part, it's a little bit more difficult. Physio or physi means the nature of something. Ology is a study of it. So it's the nature of how something works. And in other terms or simpler terms, that would mean the function of something. So we have the parts of the body and then we have how do they work and their relationship to one another. The relationship to one another is called form fits function is usually the term or structure fits function. And what does that mean? Well, let's take a look at the human eye, for example. The human eye has a certain physiology. Its physiology is for vision, to see things. And the anatomy allows it to perform its function appropriately. For example, when we look at the structure of the eye, we have the iris, we have the lens, we have the retina in the back that's shaped and has this curvature to it. We have fluid called the vitreous humor on the inside that's able to reflect, reflect and refract light that incomes and that comes into the eye, and then we have the optic nerve that sends those impulses and the images to the brain so the brain could perceive them. We would not be able to do that if it weren't for the anatomy of the eye. So anatomy will always fit physiology. Form fits function. The characteristics of life, you may remember this, I had a saying if you took me, or if you had Miss Haller too, we call it Mr. Gromack. And I got this from actually when I was in college, one of my college professors used this term and it always stuck. So Mr. Gromack, the nine characteristics of life that make something living. All living things have to be able to maintain a metabolism. Metabolism just talks about all the chemical reactions in the human body, and those chemical reactions really involve energy. How do you get energy and how do you use it? So the food that goes in, and the waste that is excreted or you get rid of. That's all about metabolism. The second thing is reproduction. All things could reproduce. We are sexual organisms, which means that we combine the genetic material from egg and sperm into our offspring to have a different combinations, combination of your traits. So reproduction is a big one. We accomplish that by making gametes in a process called meiosis. The third thing that all the living things have to do is grow and develop. Growth just talks about getting bigger, and development talks about going through different stages in which the shape or your anatomy will change during that time. For example, um, cells can grow, they could start off pretty small, but then they could get bigger in size. But if you start with a zygote, it will actually develop into a embryo, which develops into a fetus, which develops into the baby, which develops into a juvenile kid who develops into adolescence and eventually adulthood. So that shows a developmental process. Responding to stimuli is the next one in Mr. Gromack. Um, anything that you respond to is called a stimulus. And so that could be an external thing like temperature or light, or it could be an internal thing like not having enough glucose or having too much or too little glucose in your blood system. You have to respond to those conditions in order to maintain a certain balance. All living things contain a certain organizational level. It's, I'm actually showing you the organizational levels over here. So down over here we have kind of a chemical level where we talk about subatomic particles, atoms and molecules, and even organelles. And then we kind of go into the cellular, cellular level, as in the organelles, the parts that make up a cell, like the nucleus, um, the different types of cells and how they differ from one another. And then we go into the tissue level when the cells work together, and then when tissues work together, it's called an organ, and when organs work together, it's an organ system, and when all your organ systems work together, you make an organism. These are the ones that we're going to be focused on, focusing on in this class. We can go above organism, but this is more the ecological aspects when you talk about communities and populations. All living things are made of at least one or more cells. Humans are multicellular organisms. We're made of trillions of cells, but a lot of the cells that make up our body are actually bacteria, which are unicellular prokaryotic organisms. So we're going to review cells too. Adaption and evolution. Living things, their main goal is to survive and reproduce and pass on their traits to their offspring. And so they need to be able to do that as best that they can when exposed to a particular environment. Anything that helps you survive and reproduce 
any sort of trait is called an adaptation. And so when your environment changes, your adaptations slowly get tweaked over time, and those changes build up to make large changes in which we term evolution. And so evolution really it involves the main mechanism called natural selection. All living things contain DNA or RNA, it's your genetic material, um, we call them nucleic acids, but they actually hold the blueprints and the instructions for how to make any organism. What's make, it, it's the instructions that make you you by making the certain proteins that you need to stay alive. And the last is homeostasis. Homeostasis is the process of maintaining an interbal, internal stable environment. So everything is working as it should be working and um, it's kind of a balancing act that you want to stay steady. And homeostasis is um, one that I'm going to focus on in just a second. So these are the characteristics of life from metabolism to homeostasis and you can remember them by saying Mr. Gromack. Let's look at homeostasis. Homeostasis is maintaining a stable internal environment. So how do you, you have to do this by responding to external or internal stimuli. Um, and your body is very good, and any organism is very good at regulating homeostasis by making sure you're balanced. So let's look at these two pictures down here. They're very simple because I think it will help you kind of get the overview of what homeostasis really means. Home, homeo means the same. Stasis means standing or steady. So this is a steady state. And when you're in a steady state, it w it's what we call a... Um, we're balanced. Anytime that your body is out of balance, then we say that you're out of homeostasis or you have a homeostatic imbalance and we need to get it back to the balancing point. The balancing point is called the set point. So if we talk about temperature in your body, the set point or the balance point is typically 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius. That's within a certain range where your body needs to be to maintain its homeostasis or balance. However, we know that we could rise our temperature or lower our temperature based on different things that could happen like sickness or being exposed to um, cold elements outside. Your body needs to maintain the set point and so it has to do that usually chemically by um, these two processes that get it back to normal called negative or positive feedback. Negative feedback is the main one that happens in living organisms, and it, what it does, it stabilizes your condition. So if you go too high or too low, it will bring it back to the set point. If it's positive feedback, positive feedback is the opposite of negative feedback. It's actually not super common in our bodies, but there are a few examples. This condition will amplify instead of stabilize. What does that mean? Well, instead of actually, if your temperature goes up, negative feedback will bring it back down. But positive feedback is if your temperature keeps going up, your body will m keep making it go up until something else responds to it. That's not a good example. You don't use positive feedback to regulate your temperature, but that's kind of giving you the idea. Some different examples of positive feedback in your body would be um, blood clotting. Blood clotting, let's say you get cut on your arm and you start bleeding a lot. Well, you need a form of clot to stop that bleeding because that's you're throwing your body out of homeostasis. Well, the platelets in your blood are the ones that actually form the clots. So the platelets in the area start actually rushing to the injured area. They release chemicals that attract more platelets to form a clot. And so it's an amplification. The more platelets, the more platelets you're going to get because they're calling more over by chemicals. Another positive feedback is um, childbirth. During labor, the head of the baby will push on the opening of the uterus called the cervix, and that releases a hormone to the brain that actually causes more and more and more contractions until the baby is actually born. So that's an amplification of something. Um, another one is women who breastfeed. The lactation, lactation process is stimulated by the baby suckling on the mother, and that actually produces more and more milk to be made, so it amplifies certain things. And amplification will eventually bring the body back to homeostasis, but in a roundabout method. I want to actually look at negative feedback since that's the main method that living organisms use to maintain homeostasis. This system is how we don't go 
too far high or too far low of anything. We maintain our set point. So let's talk about how this actually works with this little diagram down here. So um, here's our balancing act. So this is our set point where our homeostasis should be. But if something happens and we get an imbalance, there's some sort of signal that will be sensed by a sensor or also known as a receptor. So the receptor is like, hey, hey, something's wrong here. Then it will send a signal to the part of the body that could do something about it. Most of the cases, most of the time, it's the brain. The brain will decide what needs to be done in order to correct this imbalance and then send a signal to the part of the body that could do something about it. And that's called the effector. The effector will do a chemical process that causes you to hit your set point again. So let's use a non-biological example real quick. If you have in your house, if you have a heater and an air conditioning unit, this will make sense to you. So during the summer months when it's really hot, you set your thermostat, you want the temperature to be 72 degrees Fahrenheit. But if it goes above there, your thermometer in your house actually senses that it's above normal. So your receptor would be your thermometer in the house. And then they will send a signal electrically to your heating unit or your thermal unit. That's a control center. The control center will send the signal to the unit that could, the part that could do something about it, which in this case would be your air conditioner. And then the air conditioner, it will cool the air until it brings it back to the set point of whatever you set your thermostat for. And so that's how it actually works. And again, if you go below something, if the temperature gets too cold during the winter time, then the same signals will be sent back to the control center and the, the air will be warmed by the heater to warm the air back to normal or whatever you set the point to be. And that's kind of how negative feedback works. Here's a real example in your body with temperature. So what happens here is that the balance point is, you know, about 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 degrees. But if it goes above that, your brain and your skin receives that signal and senses it, sends a sends a signal to your brain. A particular part of your brain called the hypothalamus controls your temperature. So your hypothalamus will be like, oh, well, I'm gonna send a message to the sweat glands because the sweat glands could start to release that heat by sweating. And so the sweat glands are the effectors that are able to bring your temperature back down to normal. If you look down here, if your temperature goes below normal, then your skin and your brain will receive it, send the signal to the hypothalamus, which is a control center. It controls what's gonna happen it decides that it needs to tell the skeletal muscles to start to shiver because the shivering is a contraction that produces heat and they start shivering which makes heat that brings your temperature back up to normal and this is what we call negative feedback. It also happens with your glucose in your blood so if you are hyperglycemic, you have too much sugar in your blood, your pancreas is a control center that will send out the insulin to bring it back down to normal. But if you're hypoglycemic, then the signal is received by your pancreas, which will send out a hormone called glucagon, which will actually put the sugar back in your bloodstream in order to raise your sugar in your blood back to normal. So that's another example of a negative feedback mechanism. So the last thing I want to touch on is the levels of organization. So this first chapter is going to cover pretty much everything here as an overview and a, and a review. So down over here, we're going to look at the chemical level. We're going to review at, at chemistry with atoms, molecules, and macromolecules like DNA and proteins and carbs and lipids. And then we're going to review the cell parts and the cell processes. And then we're going to actually, I'm going to introduce you to tissues, which you've probably never heard about. And I'm going to do an overview of major organs of the different organ systems and what each of the organ systems actually function to do. And so that's the main thing that we're going to cover in this class. And I hope that that was helpful.